good morning, everybody. Um, it was fairly obvious the way the numbers were going in the last few days that it would have not been possible for us to come out of lockdown uh, tomorrow or Friday. And given also um, the health advice about where the situation is, it would have also not been realistic for the New South Wales government to made, make a decision about the next two weeks, given where we are today. For that reason, uh, I will be announcing now that uh, New South Wales will be, or Greater Sydney, will be in lockdown for a further four weeks till the 28th of August. Uh, that includes all of Greater Sydney, the Central Coast, the Blue Mountains, Shell Harbour and Wollongong. Uh, whilst we're closely looking at those areas outside the Sydney metropolitan area. Based on the health advice, it's too risky at this stage to release any of them. And so therefore, all those areas currently in lockdown will continue to be in lockdown for a further uh, four weeks to the 28th of August. Uh, last night to 8 p.m. we had 94,000 people come forward for testing, which remains consistently high and we need that to continue. Uh, unfortunately, we had 177 new cases of community transmission. 46 of these uh, were infectious in the community and that's the key number we're really looking at uh, in the next few weeks. We really want that 46 number to come down to as close to zero as possible because that will give us confidence that there aren't chains of transmission in the community. I want to assure the people of New South Wales uh, that our government, based on the health advice, has given consideration to a number of measures that we'll also be announcing this morning. And I want to thank everybody involved in the process, but I also want to thank the people of our state for their vigilance and uh, positively, we've managed to keep uh, the disease out of the regions by and large and the regions will continue to have the existing restrictions without having to have anything further imposed on them at this stage but it's obviously an ongoing challenge to make sure we keep it that way and I want to thank everyone in our regional communities for that. I also in particular want to thank uh, members of the community in southwestern Sydney especially the Fairfield local government area where we've seen in that community uh, numbers stabilise and go down uh, which is a reflection of the hard work that communities put in and these are the types Type of opportunities that we know can also exist in other parts of Sydney that are now going through a higher number of cases. So firstly, we're going to make consistent the rules around shopping, uh, which are the same as the rules around exercise. So we don't want anyone to go shopping outside of their local government area or more than 10 kilometres away. We are seeing people go travelling those longer distances to do what's critical shopping, but we know that workplaces and where people gather, including places of uh, essential uh, services or essential goods, is causing transmission. So during the next four weeks, uh, we don't want anybody to go shopping outside of 10 k's or within their local government area to make sure that locals stay local. Uh, in relation to the local government areas of concern, uh, based on Dr Chan's advice, we're increasing the number of local government areas uh, which are of concern. That means that in these local government areas, nobody can work outside of that local government area uh, unless, unless they're a health or, or aged care worker or on the list of critical workers that's already out there. So if, until this point in time, Fairfield, Canterbury, Bankstown, Liverpool, Cumberland and Blacktown local government areas were subject to those rules. We don't want anyone leaving the house in those areas unless they absolutely have to. And if they must work, uh, it's only for health and aged care or only for those authorised list of workers which are publicly available that people can leave those areas. We're now expanding that list of local government areas to three additional large government, local government areas and that's based on Dr Chan's advice. That is Parramatta, George's River and Campbelltown and all the suburbs in those local government areas. So please note that if you live in those three new local government areas, uh, you are not allowed uh, to leave that area for work unless you're a health and aged care worker or unless you're an authorised worker on that limited list that we have. So it's really important for people in those three local government areas to appreciate the virus is now circulating in their community at a rate that we think is too dangerous to allow them uh, to go out for work unless it's in those critical industries that we've identified. And in relation to those three local government areas, those rules come into place from midnight tonight to make sure that we stop the spread of the virus in those local government areas. Uh, can I also stress that in relation to testing for people coming out of those local government areas, the Fairfield local government area will now be reduced to aged care and healthcare workers who are leaving that area for testing because we've seen case numbers stabilise and go down. Uh, health and aged care workers will require that three-day testing. However, 
for Canterbury Bankstown local government area. We want to make sure that every single worker who leaves that local government area is tested every three days because Canterbury Bankstown has now become the central spot where most cases are being generated. So if you live in the Canterbury Bankstown local government area, please get tested uh, every three days if you work in health and aged care or those critical list of workers that we've identified. Now in relation to uh, a non-occupied construction. So outside of those eight local government areas, we will allow non-occupied construction. And I want to thank uh, the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer for working with the stakeholders to make sure those COVID safety plans are in place. But I want to stress that no construction activity can or will occur in those eight local government areas. But outside those eight local government areas, non-occupied construction, that means construction on premises where nobody is living or staying, uh, can proceed and uh, the government has worked with industry and of course with the input of our health advice, our health experts, to make sure those safety plans are in place. But it's one thing to have those plans and another thing to make sure you stick by those plans. And I want to make that very clear. Outside of those eight local government areas, uh, we will also allow uh, limited activity for what we call contactless tradies. If uh, tradies can come uh, to a premise without having contact with anybody and undertaking work, that will be allowable. Uh, and again, uh, those details will be made available um, today to both stakeholders and the community. But that has to happen outside those eight local government areas, not within those eight local government areas which were specified. Uh, I also want to stress that we appreciate that this means another four weeks, another month of homeschool learning for, for children and parents and teachers across uh, Greater Metropolitan Sydney and Central Coast Blue Mountains, Shell Harbour and Wollongong. And we know what a stress that is for parents, uh, but we want to provide certainty to say in the next, uh, next four weeks, uh, children will continue to need to be homeschooled except for Year 12. And uh, our intention is that Year 12 face-to-face -face learning recommences in two weeks time on Monday the 16th of August but I want to be clear that that is based on the fact that within those eight LGAs of concern the New South Wales government will be vaccinating students 16 to 18 years of age who are in year 12 so year 12 students uh, because the Pfizer vaccine is allowed uh, in, in young adults or young children or, um, or adolescents. So for Year 12 students in those LGAs, the New South Wales Government will start a vaccination program. And I want to stress there that whilst um, we haven't been given extra doses of the vaccine from any other government, other states or the federal government, I want to thank in advance excuse me, regional New South Wales, um, where we will take some Pfizer vaccines, um, given the changing health advice around AstraZeneca, and make sure uh, that Year 12 students in those local government areas of concern are provided with that vaccine. We don't want students coming to face-to-face -face learning, getting the virus and then taking it home to their families. And that's why we will start a vaccination program. And I want to thank and advance New South Wales Health and Education for working with that. Teachers, of course, can take now the AstraZeneca based on the health advice because any adult is able to take the AstraZeneca. Uh, and of course, education and health will have more to say about that moving forward. But our intention is that Year 12 learning recommence face to face on Monday, the 16th of August. And we wanted to provide that certainty to the community. Uh, I'm also uh, pleased to confirm that we appreciate um, what a stress it's been, especially for people doing the right thing who live by themselves. Uh, so uh, in relation to the singles buddy system or the singles bubble, whatever people would like to call that, if you have been or are living by yourself, you are allowed to nominate one person that's allowed to visit you, uh, but it has to be the same person. Uh, so it can be a family member, it can be a member of another household, uh, but it has to be one person and it has to be outside of those eight local government areas. If you're within those eight local government areas, it has to be somebody within your local government area or within that 10 kilometre distance. But if, it's, if you live outside those local government areas, you nominate one person, but it has to be the same person. You can't have a different person every day. You have to nominate the one person that is your buddy or is, your, um, or, or is part of your singles bubble for the next four weeks uh, to make sure that we don't spread the virus. Because unfortunately we know Again, that apart from workplaces where critical work has to occur, households remain the biggest problem in New South Wales. And I don't want to dwell on this example, but I feel I have to given the statistics. Uh, the reason why we have contained 
funerals to 10 people is because how contagious this virus is. That funeral that was held at Pendle Hill where 50 people attended, or the, or the grievance or the bereavement, where 50 people attended, 45 people now have the virus out of that 50. 45. And just to, give, just to bring home that you might think you're doing your grandmother or your aunt a favour by dropping in and giving them food or going in to say hello, but that could be their death sentence. Do not do it. Uh, I don't want to dwell on that one example, but it's a stark example when people think they're supporting one another, their loved ones in a time of crisis. But instead now, 45 out of 50 people have the virus. Please do not move amongst households. It doesn't matter if it's your brother, your sister, your grandmother, uh, that could be passing on the virus and, and really causing serious illness or worse to those closest to you. And I can't stress that enough. Uh, can I also stress that the New South Wales Government, and I want to thank New South Wales Health, have already contacted suppliers and will be in touch with industry about at rapid antigen testing. So we are keen to have rapid antigen testing at key work sites and also um, at school campuses when Year 12 goes back. So we're really keen to make sure rapid antigen testing becomes part of our, our uh, fight against the COVID. But please know that we accept it's not as accurate as other types of testing, but at least it does give us an indication of where cases might be. And Dr Chant um, can provide any answers to questions relating to this but I understand it's more likely to provide a positive test than not which is not a bad thing uh, but we know that it's not just the only solution but it's part of our solution in fighting COVID at this time so uh, New South Wales Health will be talking to work sites and industry about how we can access uh, rapid antigen testing and utilize it on the ground and of course New South Wales Health will be work working with education to make sure there's some level of rapid antigen testing for year 12 students when they resume face-to-face uh, face-to-face -face learning. Uh, can I also make this point? Um, the New South Wales Treasurer and myself uh, have spent hours and hours um, speaking with the federal government about financial assistance. Now let me make it clear, it was made clear to us some weeks ago that JobKeeper was off the table. And notwithstanding that, um, can I say we fought for our citizens and we have received additional funding support from the Commonwealth. And I do want to thank uh, the Prime Minister and the Federal Treasurer for, for providing that extra support. The Treasurer will speak about that um, in a few minutes. Uh, please know that it involves uh, extra payment for disaster payments. So if you're out of work, you'll get extra dollars every week and you only need to apply once. So every week the money will go automatically into your account. So if you're out of work or have had reduced hours, please do not worry. You will get that weekly payment. The additional category of people that will receive assistance are those people that might already be on some kind of payment from the Commonwealth, but not enough to keep them going. So that gap will now also be closed. So for people who are on existing allowances, um, you will also get a top up to make sure that you keep going during the next month. And businesses also will get extra support and I'll allow the treasurer to make those details apparent, but please know uh, we fought our guts out for these extra payments. I'm glad they're here. And I do say that it will keep us going. People should not feel stressed about their financial position. We certainly do not want people uh, people joining the unemployment queue, quite the contrary. We want people to rely on these payments so that they can keep going without stress, knowing that there'll be money for what they need in the next four weeks. Whether you're a business, whether you're an individual, whether you're someone who gets a part payment already, please know that you will be supported during this time. And the Prime Minister will be making a formal announcement about this in the next few hours. And again, I want to thank him and the Treasurer for listening to myself and our Treasurer from New South Wales and acceding to our request for additional support. And of course, the New South Wales Government will also be kicking in our end of the bargain on that as well. And I'll allow the Treasurer to outline that. But let me make it very clear. Uh, uh, we appreciate, I appreciate personally, what we're asking people to do for the next four weeks. But it's because we want to keep our community safe and want to make sure that we can bounce back as quickly as possible. So please know we fought hard, we were listened to, and that additional funding will be made available. Uh, and I'll, I'll let the Treasurer uh, talk about further details about that. Can I also stress that people should expect a greater police presence, a greater focus on compliance because we know the recurring incidents where this is, uh, where the disease is transferring. It's in workplaces and it's within households. 
and we really need people to do the right thing at all times. Do not let your guard down. If you see somebody not doing the right thing, please report it. Uh, please report it. Uh, when any of us see anything which is not according to the health rules, or you see even in your own workplace, report it. We can't put up with people continuing to do the wrong thing because it's setting us all back. And I can confirm, um, again, having conversations with the commissioner, police commissioner, uh, that that compliance activity will increase, uh, the police presence will increase, and we just ask everybody to do more to report those who aren't doing the right thing, but also to be vigilant in making sure you're doing the right thing. And finally, before I, I hand over to Dr Chant, I want to say the following. Please ensure if you can get vaccinated, get the vaccine. We know the vaccine protects against Delta. Delta is different to any other strain of COVID that we've seen. Our state's been incredibly successful in dealing with every other strain, strain of COVID, but Delta is different. But the one positive that we do have is that the vaccine is working. People with the vaccine are staying out of hospital, they're spreading it less than others, and we know it's an important protection. Please come forward and get vaccinated. The New South Wales government has pivoted our strategy based on what we've been told by the Commonwealth and other states in relation to the Pfizer vaccine, in relation to the changed health advice with AstraZeneca. We've really upped the ante, and I want to say thank you. In the last few days, we've had tens of thousands of people get the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is great. But please also know, as Dr Chant will say, the day you get the vaccine doesn't give you immediate cover. It takes about two to three weeks for the vaccine to kick into your system. So remain as vigilant as ever. It doesn't mean you can't get the virus or spread it, but of course it is an enormous protection. So uh, I say to the citizens of New South Wales, thank you for your patience. Uh, please know that I'm as upset and as frustrated as all of you that we weren't able to get the case numbers we would like to you know, at this point in time. Uh, and that's the reality. We have to deal with the cards that are here before us. We have to deal with the situation at hand. And that's why we've taken the action we have based on the health advice to make uh, these new arrangements today. And please know that in the coming days, if there are any gaps, we'll fix them. If there are any categories we've overlooked, we'll fix them. If Dr Chan's health advice asks us to adjust, adjust anything, we will do that. Because there are no rule books in a pandemic. Things can change very quickly one way or the other. And if we find in the next few weeks, for example, that parts of greater metropolitan Sydney, like the Central Coast or Wollongong or Shell Harbour are doing better and don't have any virus, well, we can also take decisions as we did in Orange to allow that community to live more free, those communities to live more freely. But again, it's all up to all of us. It's up to all of us to make sure we do the right thing. And we also speak up when we see others not doing the right thing. So now I'll ask Dr Chant to provide her update, the Deputy Premier to say a few words, uh, the Treasurer to say a few words, and then of course we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. So New South Wales recorded 177 locally acquired cases in the 24 hours to 8pm last night. It's so pleasing to see those high testing levels of 94,532 tests. And I want to thank the hardworking pathology companies, the community, and also our collectors for doing that amazing work. Sadly, we've had a death overnight in a woman in her 90s who died yesterday at Liverpool Hospital. It was not related to the Liverpool Hospital um, outbreak that we had discussed um, previously, but this is the 11th COVID death related to the current outbreak. She was not vaccinated and tested positive on the July 24th. There are currently 165 COVID cases admitted to hospital, 56 people in intensive care, and 22 of whom require ventilation. As the Premier has said, we are confronting a situation where the two key drivers of transmission remain connections between household transmission and also workplaces. Now, clearly a number of workplaces need to continue to work and those workplaces can generate uh, exposures um, and we have clusters of cases there which then take it back to those households, triggering another cycle. But the pos on a positive note, the things that we know work. We know lockdowns work and we just have to hold our course. And we also know that we have other tools that we haven't had before. And those other tools are vaccination. And can I please just stress again that it is important that we use vaccine. 
as a way to assist us and it will be our future in terms of coming to terms with COVID and at a time when we will have to accept that we have community transmission. So we need to get those vaccine um, coverage levels up. We need to protect our most vulnerable, which is our elderly, for which COVID is a very severe disease, but we need to up our COVID, COVID vaccine coverage across all age groups. Can I just indicate an initiative that um, the local health district has put in place at Prairiewood Youth and Community Centre, 194 to 222 Restwell Road, Prairiewood. There is a clinic there, an AstraZeneca clinic, which is open from 8 till 4.30 p.m. And just a big shout out to the community of Fairfield that that, that community, that centre is going to be open for walk-ins. So you don't need a booking or an appointment um, that centre will be open and available to provide access to complement the role of general practice, complement the other health services in the area and complement the pharmacies. So my key message is we need to hold the course. We all have a part to play in getting through this and that, that the path forward is a combination of remaining at home and staying at home. Leave, every time you leave the house, ensuring that you believe that you're coming into contact with someone with COVID. So do not interact with others. Uh, do not have conversations when you're meeting up with people in the supermarket that you know. This is a time if we all act diligently to make sure that we don't have any contact with anyone outside our household, we'll, it will help us get on top of this. Also, as we've seen, the greatest risk is the household. So again, I know that you do want to take the opportunity to visit other people, but please do not. This is too critical to protect you and your loved ones to stay at home. And my other key message is get vaccinated. And also, whenever you have symptoms, get tested. We're still seeing people that have been in workplaces for a number of days whilst infectious. And that poses a risk to that workplace and also will then lead to the introduction into another set of households and trigger further transmission. So thank you to the communities. Also, can I express my gratitude to the communities of Southwestern Sydney? Um, I grew up in Punchbowl um, and had the privilege of working in Southwestern Sydney based at Liverpool, uh, Bankstown initially and Lidcombe and then moving to Liverpool. And I had the privilege of working with the communities of Western and Southwestern Sydney. They are such strong, resilient communities. And I want to acknowledge the role that community leaders and others and those communities have in getting the messages out and supporting the communities at this difficult time. So my heart goes out to those communities, but these steps and actions are required to protect you and your loved ones. And again, I urge you to take up the opportunities for vaccination as soon as possible recognising that for even the protection from the first dose, we need two to three weeks. And so there is an urgency that you go out and avail yourself of vaccine. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> the greatest threat to regional and rural New South Wales is, of course, a breach that could possibly come out of southwestern Sydney or Sydney in general. And that's why vaccination is very, very important. And getting rates of vaccination, especially in those eight LGAs up, is going to be important in protecting regional and rural New South Wales. And that's why this morning's decision to also support Year 12 students in those eight LGAs, where we are redirecting Pfizer doses from regional and rural New South Wales into those eight LGAs to to support Year 12 students in their most important part of their educational journey is something that is supported and something that has merit. And to, to the people of regional rural New South Wales, can I say firstly thank you, uh, because the opportunity for vaccination continues as we roll out AstraZeneca right across regional rural New South Wales and the state. So that is the first point that I must make, that this is about supporting Year 12 students in those eight LGAs, students that are in their final year, and to redirect doses from the bush uh, to those LJs is appropriate and supported. Can I also touch on construction as the Premier touched on today? We have announced that construction will return uh, later this week on Saturday. 
The first part, of course, is that we're also allowing construction in, in the, sorry, what I should say, non-occupied construction sector, that they may return to site tomorrow onwards in relation to prep works. Now, these are basic works, getting your machinery, uh, maintenance done, preparing your sites for a very COVID safe construction site, OHS issues, uh, also receiving delivery. So very narrow uh, view of what you can do over the next couple of days to prepare your sites so that you can go and recommence construction on Saturday onwards. In relation to um, non-occupied construction, it will allow construction to recommence right across the city outside of those eight LGAs that were mentioned that will continue to see no construction and no movement of construction workers leaving those LGAs. For the rest of the sector, what we are focused on is making sure that there is no contact with households and tradies. And that's why we've put in place COVID measures to support those smaller projects, the reno, the, the small projects internally and externally by a range of measures. Firstly, no contact uh, with those households. In some cases, we would ask those residents of those households to, to vacate the premises or vacate the areas of work. There'll be a cap on the number of tradies at any one time internally, being the maximum cap of two, and externally a maximum cap of five. This will allow some level of construction in those areas. But I must stress that this area must be an area that we, we are focused on, and that is about no contact with households. If that, you can't achieve that, then, then those works won't be permitted. This is about making sure that we get construction back up and running, as we've promised, the pause that we put in place, can I say thank you to the sector who have been positive over the last two weeks, have worked with the government in making sure we put in place those measures that will protect people from spreading the virus. As you've seen in today's numbers, we still have a challenge in Sydney in relation to the spread. So this is actually a gesture of goodwill by the government uh, through health advice, working with the sector to allow the sector to start back up later this week. We've already heard the, the economic impact by shutting down construction, the ongoing ripple effect that has across the broader economy and I'm sure uh, the Treasurer will have more to say about that. So today being able to have uh, unoccupied construction return, uh, having the ability for traders to do a level of work in occupied premises through a contact uh, free environment will give everybody the opportunity to recommence. And again to the people of regional rural New South Wales, the redirection of the Pfizer vaccine is important to make sure we give our Year 12 students in those eight LGAs every opportunity, as much as the opportunity that kids in regional rural New South Wales have at the moment, which is face-to-face -face education, the opportunity to face their exams in the same level as uh, in the regions. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, we appreciate that this is a very difficult day for our state, uh, for our people and for businesses. Uh, but we will get through this difficult time stronger um, on the other side. We've always said uh, as a state that uh, we'll put the economy before the budget, our people, our workers and businesses, uh, and ensure that there's a financial support available uh, to keep people in work uh, and businesses in business uh, during this difficult time. Uh, today I can announce uh, in conjunction with the federal government uh, that we'll be expanding our Job Saver program uh, to ensure that more businesses are eligible uh, to access those weekly payments. We currently uh, have a turnover threshold of $50 million. We'll be expanding that from this week, backdated to Monday, uh, to $250 million. Uh, that will ensure that uh, around 460,000 businesses uh, with a turnover reduction of 30% will be eligible for those support payments. Uh, that's up from 230,000 businesses, uh, and that has coverage of around 3.3 million workers uh, right across the state. Uh, today we can also announce that we'll be increasing those maximum payments, uh, those weekly payments from $10,000 per week uh, to $100,000 per week. Uh, that will ensure that businesses uh, have the cash flow and the financial support to get through this. Uh, importantly, we've made it very clear that businesses cannot reduce their headcount. We want to make sure uh, that workers remain connected uh, to their businesses as we move through uh, this lockdown period. I want to thank the Federal Government, the Prime Minister and the Federal Treasurer for the constructive discussions uh, that we've had um, and for this increased financial support. Uh, in total, if you look at 
Um, the other support packages, the other business packages that we have here in New South Wales, almost 99% of businesses have had a downturn of around 30% uh, will be able to apply for financial assistance. Uh, whether that's a micro business, a medium sized business or a large business, uh, please go to Service New South Wales. Uh, please be patient. We've allocated a lot of resources in there. There are many businesses applying. We want to get that money out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, and I appreciate the support from the federal government, which takes our total weekly support Support combined to $650 million uh, per week um, for that program. Uh, in addition to that, um, the Prime Minister later today will be making an announcement um, in relation to those individual payments, those disaster payments and expansion of that program. I appreciate uh, the consideration they've given to the concerns um, that we have raised and I think that the support package that we're announcing this morning, uh, combined with the support package that the Federal Government to the Prime Minister will be making this afternoon, uh, will ensure that all workers in this state uh, all businesses in this state uh, get the support they need to come out stronger the other side, and we will as a state. We've done that over the last 18 months, uh, and we'll do it again. Uh, briefly on construction, uh, today's announcement is significant. Uh, construction is a very important part of the New South Wales economy, a very important part of the New South Wales workforce, um, and bringing back this uh, construction activity today uh, will add around $500 million to the New South Wales economy every week. Um, and that's incredibly important for the workers and for those businesses to keep going. I really want to thank uh, the industry. We've had daily meetings uh, with the construction industry and the broader business community uh, to make sure those COVID safe plans were in place. It's been a difficult uh, couple of weeks, uh, but uh, that dialogue uh, and that feedback and the partnership with the New South Wales government has ensured that we can bring back uh, construction in a COVID safe way. So just finally, my message uh, to the people of New South Wales today is yes, it's a difficult time. Yes, the lockdown is being extended, but we will get through it. We've got through the last 18 months. Uh, we will ensure through our financial support as the situation evolves, it's always there to keep people in work and businesses in business right across our state. Thanks. Dr. Thanks. Dr. 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 Is it possible to get there after four weeks? Well, look, that's obviously our intention, but we've seen uh, how we've struggled to reduce that number of infectious in the community, and that is apparent. But if we want to live freely, uh, whilst vaccination rates remain rather low, that is the one target we need to stick to. Uh, but I'm hopeful of a couple of things. Firstly, that the public will heed the ongoing messages we've provided about what the greatest risks are household contact and workplaces. And I was so disturbed when I saw images uh, today publicly made available of workplaces not even wearing masks indoors or not even complying to the health orders. This cannot happen and compliance will feature strongly in the next four months, uh, whether it's in workplaces, whether it's in other, uh, other uh, uh, places of presence. Compliance is so critical for us to be able to reduce the number of infectious people in the community, and that has to remain our target. Just on that, just on compliance, Scott Morrison's got a standing offer to you to have the Army help in terms of making sure contacts are isolating. Hey. Are you considering doing that? Oh, look, we uh, all options remain open to us, and uh, the police commissioner is in regular contact with his uh, federal counterparts. Uh, we have lots of boots on ground, and if we need more support, of course, we'll ask for it. And those meetings and discussions are ongoing. I know that we've all already received some level of support in other ways through uh, the formal uh, departments, uh, and that's ongoing. If we need more, of course, we'll have that. Uh, and that's a, a decision ultimately for um, for those in operational positions to make in terms of what's required, but I do want to stress that it's the government's position to increase compliance, increase presence of police and other authorities, but also to work with communities on the ground because our general feedback is that in many instances, uh, because of certain difficulties or challenges, communities want to do the right thing, but might be unsure of what the right thing means. And can I just stress, uh, can I just stress very strongly, when you think you might be doing the right thing in visiting a relative or a household in your street that you may have visited every day for, for all of your life, you need to stop that because you might be thinking you're doing them a favour, but in fact, you might be presenting the virus to that entire household. But I do want to stress 
that if uh, there's any requirement from an operational perspective for us to take more support, of course we will, uh, because uh, we're throwing everything at this. Uh, we're really, really keen to see us out of this as soon as we can. So we're asking the community to support us in every way. We're asking people to come forward and get vaccinated. And uh, for me, uh, spring does provide a period of hope. We have seen in the last few days vaccination rates with the AstraZeneca go through the roof. And uh, Dr. Chant, Minister Hazard and I in particular were looking at those numbers and very pleased the public is responding. But we know that having more vaccines in arms doesn't just protect the individual, but it slows the spread. And we know that's so critical moving forward. So yes, absolutely reducing the number of infectious in the community remains the goal. And um, if Dr. Chant wants to add to that, I'll, I'll ask her to comment. We have to, because we can't open up and live freely unless we have that number close to zero, uh, or unless we have high rates of vaccination. You've said, you said, you said, and Dr. Chant has said again today, that we know lockdowns work. But the first two weeks didn't work, and nor did the second two-week extension. What makes you think the next four weeks are going to be any different? Yeah, can I just be um, clear about a couple of points? Firstly, had we not gone into lockdown, there is absolutely no doubt no doubt we would have had thousands and thousands of cases uh, today but also many more deaths and that is something we need to continue to prevent uh, first and foremost and i wear this responsibility very heavily and anyone in my position would but keeping our community safe and keeping our community out of hospital remains our number one priority and had we not taken the action we had we would have had thousands and thousands of cases today. And secondly, but can, can, I, can you please let me finish this important point? The second point is having an extra concentration and adding in those extra LGAs where that authorised list of workers is very short. We now have eight LGAs of most highly populated parts of our community in Greater Sydney not able to leave their home for work unless they're categorised as a very critical worker. Now that localised targeted response uh, is what we hope will have the desired effect. Having fewer people mobile from those communities where we know the virus is circulating. And the other, the other positive is whilst we have had examples of the virus getting out into other areas, uh, the health experts and the concerted effort has allowed us to contain it within certain parts of Sydney, not allow it to get out into other parts such as the Central Coast or Wollongong or Shell Harbour at this stage, or the regions for that matter. And that is something that we should hold up to as, as something that we've managed to achieve. Having said that, none of us want to be in this situation. And I know how tough it's going to be. You know, I'm not someone that doesn't have close relatives or friends or family or people doing it tough, whether it's businesses closing down, we're all affected. And none of us are immune from that and what that means. And you take these decisions heavily because you know what it means for the community. But the overall, overall goal for us as a government is to keep people alive and out of hospital and healthy. And, and can I make this point? Uh, if you live in a household, the best way you can keep your household safe is not to leave that household unless uh, it's for the strict reasons that we've provided, but we do encourage people for their mental health to take up the opportunity to exercise. So long as you stick to the rules, outdoor exercise, as Dr. Chant will say, is a healthy response both to physical health and mental health during this time. And we also ask everybody to please think about every time you step out the door, especially if you live in those eight LGAs, uh, this is a fact. Every time you step out the door, chances are you will be in close proximity to someone who has the virus or has a close contact who has the virus. That is just a fact. So be very deliberate every time you leave the house, whether you live in those eight local government areas or whether you don't. And can I stress that each of those local government areas has a number of suburbs within it. So just because we haven't named your suburb doesn't mean you're not affected. So if you're not sure, please make sure you know which local government area you live in. Please make sure uh, you know uh, whether you're subject to those extra strict rules, uh, that extra harsh rules we've put in place to try and reduce the number of people infectious in the community. There was a situation at RPA last night, a COVID positive patient spent something like five or six hours waiting in an ambulance and was only found in bed at 2am uh, at Concord Hospital. 
Uh, look, uh, I'm not aware of um, not aware of that, but I'll ask either Minister Hazard or Dr. Chant to respond to that. Do we know on the hospital situation as well? Um, Alex, no, we're not. Uh, the hospitals are handling it very well. It's a normal sort of situation in a pandemic that when you have a patient come into the uh, emergency department, as happened, uh, they manage it and they manage it through the appropriate avenues. I was briefed this morning that uh, there were no major issues there. Having said that, as I said, I think. That's, that's sorry, that's Alex. Normal sorry, Alex. That someone would spend that long waiting in ambulance COVID positive. Well, they were looking. They were obviously managing the situation in a COVID pandemic. But I think more broadly, a couple of weeks ago, you'd know that we had a couple of hundred staff that were taken offline here at um, North Shore. I can't remember whether you were here that day at that press conference, but I did say that. And I think there was a hundred taken offline at uh, Fairfield at one stage. But look, it's all. We've got 140,000 staff in the health system. It's the biggest health system. It's almost double the. Uh, the defence force in the country. So we manage it. But is it under stress? Of course it's under stress. And I want to thank the frontline health workers, the doctors and the nurses who literally are putting their lives at risk. And I want to emphasise that government can only do so much. In the end, the community and every individual has a responsibility here to make sure that you respond in a way that you need to respond in a pandemic. Governments can only do so much. We set the parameters, we ask you to comply, we do that off the base of the health advice and broader advice, but each individual in our New South Wales community has a responsibility and it's a responsibility to listen and to respond to the requirements of the health orders, but also as the Premier and as Dr Chan have said, to go and get vaccinated. You need to get vaccinated, it provides that extra layer of safety. As a health minister, I've got to say, on behalf of all health staff in New South Wales, it's not really fair that our health staff are being put at risk because people are not listening and not complying with what the health orders require. So I just stress that each of us have a responsibility. Don't put the nurses, don't put the doctors at risk by exposing yourself or your family to the virus. Just listen and comply with please, comply with what we're asking you to do and we'll get through this. Can I ask you about your advice, Dr. Chas, uh, just in relation to the advice you provided to the government. Last time we saw you, we were talking about the need for a tight lockdown, you said, we cannot have more people going through the workplace and not being able to get to their jobs. Have you changed your mind about that? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you I think it's important that the, that the community gets very clear messages that we need to work together at this critical time to respond to what no one would have ever envisaged, a pandemic that's been running for 18, 18 months since March last year. I really understand that the community are fatigued. I think business is fatigued. I think all of us would have liked a different, to be in a different place at this time. So I think there's some of the challenges that we're dealing with. We're also um, recognising that the people of South Western Sydney and Western Sydney keep our businesses, keep our city functioning. I've just got to say how critical the workers of South Western Sydney and Western Sydney are to food and production, factories, logistics, cleaning, all of those things. So we are continuing to see um, cases of workplace um, transmission in those um, settings, in those critical illness industries. And we all are also seeing them take those infections back to their households and setting off other chains of infection. The one thing we can do as individuals is stay within our family unit because if we have not had any further interactions with anyone else, that limits the transmission. So in summary, my advice is we need to do all we can to, as a community, to adhere to the public health orders. And I'm also very pleased that um, we that we are strengthening a number of, of movements in relation to the new designated areas in order to add a diff additional control. And in relation to construction, though, Dr. Chance, in relation to construction, did you provide advice to the government that construction could resume on Saturday, or was that not your advice? So there's a range of advice that I provide, and I'm, I'm very clear that, that we're that we're on a course to get through this pandemic. I, I just want to go back to the comment about lockdowns and lockdowns not working. Lockdowns need to take some time. 
and to some extent, as the Premier has indicated, we've had some super spreader events. And those super spreader events trigger, as the Premier had indicated, there were about 50 people potentially exposed through one event. A large number of those are positive, but they in itself had set up ripples with further transmission to their households. And so every time we get a new household, it does trigger that um, transmission. Therefore, the key issue is that for everyone in a household to really limit your time outside because even if you get that household transmission and no one in that household has spent very long at the shops or any other permitted activity, then we've really broken that chain of transmission. Do you see that there's a difference between what you're saying about lockdown and the fact that lockdown is in fact being eased in some circumstances, instructions, singles bubble, is there a significant So there's a range of um, settings that have been put in, put in place and they actually try and address fundamentally a range of health issues. So government obviously considers um, COVID control, mental health, sustainability, um, and all of those factors, because in the end, we re recognise that the response to a pandemic and response to a lockdown requires both the community cooperating with us and business. And so it's all those factors that go into the mix in determining policy settings. And can I just fundamentally go back to my key point? We all need to work together at this time. The Delta variant has thrown us a curveball in terms of its transmissibility. We just need to be so strong at staying firm about the, the public health orders that are in place. Sorry. Yep. No, that's fine. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I apologise. Uh, I want to ask, do you have any modelling surrounding, um, I know we've heard the 80% figure, we need 80% of the population uh, to be vaccinated before we can live freely, but do you have any modelling surrounding how many of the public uh, need to be vaccinated before transmission drops? Is there a lower figure that might indicate, you know, if we get 60% of the population or 40% of the population vaccinated, that we'll start seeing transmission naturally drop? That we, we know from the best um, studies that vaccination both has individual protection and a very good protection. So even one dose of the vaccines provides some protection and then a second dose of the vaccines um, provides high protection against hospitalisation and death. And I'd just like to pause there and, and re remind the community about my recommendation also of bringing forward your second dose of AstraZeneca to somewhere between four and eight weeks rather than the 12 weeks in order to get that second dose in to get your booster immunity. In terms of onward transmission, we know that even having one dose of either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine does provide um, if, even if you're infected, you're less likely to transmit it significantly. All of this gives us an edge. So for instance, if we've got um, a household, if you're only going to infect two people in that household or rather than four, that would still give us an edge because those two people haven't then been out and potentially exposing others. So that's why vaccination is both a key to individual protection, but also assisting us in preventing that transmission risk. and. It does take delayed two to three weeks, but the more we can see the vaccination levels rise, um, the, the, it will assist us in um, the control. But we will need the lockdown and very strong lockdown conditions which have been put in place by government. Taking Pfizer off the grid, taking Pfizer off the grid, is that Oh, look, our, our hope is that we achieve what we want to achieve in the next four weeks. But that in large part uh, is up to all of us. And as Dr Chant said, we can't afford to have any setbacks, no exceptions. And I can, appre I can only appreciate, uh, I have a similar, very close-knit family. And if there was a bereavement, what that would mean by only having 10 people at that bereavement. But all of us, unfortunately, have to really stick to the rules. We can't afford any setbacks. As Dr Chant said, one setback has a ripple effect, which can take weeks to get on top of. And we don't want any further setbacks. And I just ask everybody to again consider not just themselves or the rest of us. They don't have to worry about the rest of us. Think about those closest to you because I, I don't think there'd be anything worse. And I again uh, 
without giving away any, any private information, I couldn't think of anything worse than passing on the disease to those you love the most and then have them die. Premier, 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 to take Pfizer off the region is a tough question. How many vaccines will be redirected? And essentially we're putting students who are sitting at HSC above people aged 40 to 60 who are more likely to die of COVID when they're the most vulnerable. Look, in a pandemic, you have to make difficult decisions. And as the Deputy Premier said, can I thank rural and regional New South Wales for the enormous role they've played in keeping the virus out of their communities. But also please know the health advice has changed in relation to AstraZeneca. In the bush, the biggest uh, challenge that we have is making points of access available for people who live long distances from a health clinic or somewhere where the vaccine's provided. That's why we've signed up pharmacists. That's why we've increased access points through New South Wales Health. There are more than 100 sites now across rural and regional New South Wales, plus a lot of regional pharmacies that are being stood up as well. So please know the access points for the vaccine have increased. And it's really just putting a pause for a few weeks on some people in the bush who, were, who want to get the Pfizer uh, because the health advice has changed. Every adult can get the AstraZeneca, but I think people would appreciate uh, the stress that Year 12 students are going through, the stress that their families are going through. And I'm so pleased that uh, rural and regional students continue to have face-to-face -face learning of all ages. And I'm pleased we've been able to maintain that. Uh, even other states, when they were going through their darkest period of lockdown, shut down schools everywhere. We've managed to keep schools in rural and regional communities open with face-to-face -face learning. And I just want to thank, you know, where, where perhaps the other states and others haven't been as generous, our own rural and regional New South Wales, who've stuck by us and we've stuck by them through thick and thin. We're one team, one community in New South Wales and I want to thank them for the sacrifice they're making. We know that we require tens of thousands of doses of Pfizer for the Year 12 students. Some of those will be taken from the bush, not all of them. Uh, all of, not, not all of them. Uh, some of them will be taken from the bush, but at New South Wales Health, please know that our vaccine capacity is now increased to nearly 350,000 just from New South Wales Health. Plus on top of that, you have the GP network. Plus on top of that, you have the pharmacist. But whilst we have a gap in doses for the next few weeks, not of AZ, but of Pfizer, we need to be nimble and flexible in a pandemic. Mm. And I don't think anybody would begrudge us doing everything we can to get Year 12 students safely back to schools. And Dr Chant will tell us she would be concerned about how having anyone uh, interact with others in those communities where the virus is very, uh, very virulent or very um, present. So Dr Chan's advice to us was, um, if you want Year 12 face to face in those local government areas, they must get vaccinated. And that's why we're working hard to provide uh, that in the next few weeks. It's been five weeks now, Premier. It's been five weeks now. Things are not going in the right direction. So another four weeks, but restrictions haven't been cut really at all. Dr Kerry Tan saying that lockdown will take some time and it will be two to three weeks before we see the effect of vaccinations on transmissibility of the virus and people who are vaccinated. It's going to be longer than four weeks. Can I, I, I dispute the premise that when you say to eight local government areas uh, with hundreds of... It works, it's very long, it's almost everyone is on it. Uh, our authorised work, just to put things into comparison, our authorised workers list is very short. Victoria's list was about 17 pages in comparison. Uh, so please note that the harsher restrictions we've put in place, uh, extending into those additional local government areas, are to have the targeted desired approach of reducing cases in those communities. Please uh, let it be known that we're asking a lot of those eight local government areas and those eight local government areas, as Dr Chance said, represent traditionally uh, cohorts of workers that keep the rest of us going. But the fact that we've limited who is allowed to leave the area for work is a big call. And I know that many, many in those local government areas will be suffering because of what we've announced today. Three additional regions, three large areas of Greater Sydney subjected to extremely harsh conditions in relation to authorised workers. That is a big call on our part but it's an important call and don't underestimate how harsh that is and I say I say to the people of this state uh, we have worked hard and continue to work hard uh, to have the, the targets the approach in those communities that are required and as Dr Chant said uh, we need to stay the course need to make sure we respect the health orders and as I've outlined today in the additional decisions the government has made in addition to that we will also be upping the ante on compliance 
and uh, Commissioner Fuller will be here tomorrow to outline what some of those measures will include. <laughs> How are you going to police these very complicated rules? Um, you know, are you going to have roadblocks out of South West Sydney having been checked that they are essential workers? What about construction sites? Are you going to be going to construction sites? And who's doing that? Well, can I say across the whole board, compliance activity uh, will increase, not just in uh, the compliance activity that currently happens, but also in relation to presence. And uh, obviously all those op uh, involved in those operational decisions uh, are making those decisions and uh, we'll have Commissioner Fuller here tomorrow to outline uh, what the New South Wales Police Force uh, will be leading in terms of the compliance activities. But that is really important. Uh, the next few weeks comes down to all of us. It comes down to not only having the best settings in place but having everybody respond to those settings. And also can I thank the community leaders who are providing those important messages at a very grassroots level. We have very grassroots strategies in communities to support people getting the right information, knowing what they need to do. But the bottom line is for everybody across Greater Sydney, the Central Coast, Blue Mountains, Shell Harbour and Wollongong, do not leave your house unless you absolutely have to. That is the basic rule. That is the basic rule that everybody needs to remember. Do not leave the house unless you absolutely have to. And of course, in large, large areas across Sydney, and including those eight local government areas, we've gone down really, really hard as to what uh, allows you to leave your area. And the list is very short. Who has an added question? Sorry. So, does the extra compliance start today or tomorrow? The, the extra compliance has been evolving. But uh, but obviously we will continue uh, we will continue to ramp up the compliance and I will uh, I have already asked and Commissioner Fuller will be here tomorrow to outline exactly what that compliance looks like. We've already had an increased presence in certain localities. We've also had increased activity on the ground. But obviously we will increase that activity given where we are and given uh, that we want to move quickly out of the current situation. Lucy, Lucy, uh, Treasurer. You want a job here to come back. Uh, I know it's going to be announced by the, by the Prime Minister later, but are you confident that where it's landed is going to be enough? Look, I, I do. I think it's a market improvement of where we were. And, um, you know, I don't want to get into marketing names, um, but ultimately it's the outcome that matters. And we want extra support for individuals who are doing it tough. We want support for those people who are on current income benefits uh, from the Commonwealth. They shouldn't be excluded. We've made that case and I think the constructive discussions that the Premier and I have had with the Prime Minister and the Federal Treasurer has landed this uh, support package uh, in the right place. But uh, you know, this won't be the end. I mean, the, the reality is the pandemic is evolving and as that uh, situation evolves, so will our financial support. Can we please, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, can we ask, do these measures reflect contingencies that this lockdown, in fact, could go longer than four weeks? Well, they're weekly payments, uh, Lucy. So um, the agreement that we've reached with the Commonwealth Government is that each week backdated from Monday, um, these uh, financial payments of now up to $100,000 uh, for businesses will be available to help get them through this difficult time. And I just want to make this point as well, which I didn't make earlier, and that is for all individuals who've had their hours reduced across the state, please contact Services Australia because that's where uh, those disaster payments we made uh, can be accessed. Um, and obviously, uh, the Prime Minister will make further announcements in relation to that this afternoon. It is still short of the job is that affecting your relationship? Affecting, sorry? Is that affecting your relationship with the federal government? No, our, 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 no our relationship is fine. And um, look, I accept that I accept that I've probably been a pain in the ass for the Prime Minister, but um, I'm here to fight for workers and for businesses right across the state, and I'll continue to do that. <laughs> So what was the question go? Sorry. On construction, if people can have phones in to do renos, but they can't be in the house, where are people supposed to go no, no, if they're not in the house? So, so the decision is, if you, if you can time your uh, maintenance work or the appropriate trade to come to your house when you go out to do your groceries or, for instance, uh, your exercise for the day, so be it. What we're actually saying is to vacate the area of work, to so segregate the home, to put in place segregation, that there is no mix between trades 
and and the household, and and, uh, and we, we want to make that absolutely clear. There can be no contact, and for works like an extension or reno at the back of the house, where you may have five trades, we expect you to have uh, and other amenities on site to deal with those trades, and we want complete segregation areas where there is it's a no-go zone for the household uh, household people. But if there's an opportunity that you're getting an air condition an air conditioner replaced for a couple of hours, and you've got an opportunity to go do your groceries, well, we'll encourage that, and that's what we want to see. Uh, but it's about vacating uh, the area of works. Did you know down the line was lending government legitimacy to companies involved in massive frauds? 